Well, the hype around South African retailers has cooled off a little following some disappointing results. The furniture retailers seemed to be having the hardest time with Ellerines reporting a sales decline for the six months ending March. But some retailers continue to power ahead with Mr. Price recently announcing that earnings would be up 23 to 28%. That's for the interim period. Stanlib's retail analyst, Teresa Heath, joins us to discuss the sector. Thanks so much for your time, Teresa. Let's start with an overview, as you see it right now, of retail and SA. All right. Well, the retail sector, I think, has probably come off the boil a little bit um, uh, more than people were expecting. I think the consumer is a little bit weaker than what people thought. So sales growth is, is down slightly. And we're starting to uh, think about whether the sales growth is enough to offset cost growth. Um, because obviously there's a lot of administered um, cost pressures that these retailers fa uh, face. Operating costs such as lease costs, um, electricity costs is a very big factor in their lives. Um, and employment costs. I mean, we're coming up for a an uh, interesting wage, wage negotiation, negotiation across the board period and um, you know retailers are, are, are not immune from that so there are a number of costs that they, they battle to control and if their top line is a little bit muted then we you know we might see some margin compression now we're not expecting that you know sort of the retail party is over and we still think that some of the retailers will continue to push through um, earnings ahead of ahead of sales growth um, so some of them, the outlook is looking better than, than for others. And certainly, as you s mentioned in your um, sort of opening brief, the, the furniture retailers are really at, at, at the forefront of things because their sales growth um, is kind of tracking at best mid-single digits at the moment. There just isn't the appetite for f um, discretionary merchandise, especially given you know, the, the amount of credit that the, that consumer has taken on in, in the last sort of couple of years. Teresa, that's a, that's a great point to raise. Obviously, uh, when you look at the, the furniture retailers, still a large majority of their sales coming from credit, credit sales. The balance, though, I mean, how easy is it in the market to measure what's actually paid for in cash as opposed to what's credit? Because even when we see the likes of Lewis saying that 73 or 74% of their sales are coming from, from, from credit that they're offering in-house, mm -hmm. the, the, the balance, uh, we think, is coming from, uh, you know, money that they might have borrowed from one of the banks. So is it, is it easy to distinguish between what's actually going on in that market? Not at all. I, I think that's the key point, is that it is very difficult to work out how much of the cash sales are fueled by credit, um, an unsecured loan, for example. And especially at that segment of the market, the chances are, are slightly higher. I mean, don't underestimate the benefit that um, social grants and real wage increases have had on that cash um, segment. So it's not only been unsecured lending for the past few years, it's also been social grants have been extended to more people. They've grown above inflation. Government has been paying um, above, above inflation wages for the last few years, and that you know, a lot of the, well, Lewis's customer base, I think, is about 40% civil service. So those are the people that really have benefited from real wage growth. So they may be in a position to pay cash for some of those purchases. So I don't think you can say that all of it is driven by unsecured lending. But I think a large portion could be, and that's the risk, is we don't really know and we can't really see. Well, let's talk about ABLE yesterday, because Ellerine's obviously is part of that stable, and the results disappointed hugely. ABLE down 17% at the close yesterday. Many saying that this is a precursor to much more trouble across the board with consumers. This is a warning sign. Do you agree? Well, I think it's difficult to know, and you know, Lewis report tomorrow, so we'll get a little bit more clarity from there. Um, certainly, We've got no indication from Lewis that earnings are going to be down drastically because we haven't had a pre-announcement. So I think for the time being, Lewis's numbers will probably be all right or in line with where expectations are. Um, what, we, what we need to work out is whether it's a sort of ABLE-specific risk or Ellerine-specific risk that perhaps maybe they, they dropped the ball on their credit underwriting or that it's the start of a sort of endemic weakness in the consumer that we just, you know, that, that maybe has been underestimated. Um, so, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll have to see. And certainly if you look at this year, the retailers that have really been hit, it's those with any exposure to credit. So the clothing retailers with high percentage of sales from credit, they are down significantly. The furniture retailers are down sort of 20, 30 percent this year. Um, and I think that the market is telling you that it doesn't want to take the risk, that there is this uh, underlying Overhang problem. that yeah. uh, could come back and bite everybody who's been very bullish, the retail story. Absolutely. Teresa, we've got, uh, even with regards to Lewis, I think we had, we had one analyst pointing out to us that the dividend yield was higher than the, the price earnings ratio. So 
a uh, lot of misery and a lot of uh, negative sentiment around the stock, but at these levels, not uh, your cup of tea at this point for uh, inclusion in the portfolio. I guess what you've got to weigh up is what is the catalyst? So what's going to move the share price up from here? And I mean, it's been hovering around this level for, for a while in terms of dividend versus um, sort of PE. And, you know, we can't really see anything that's, that's, that's going to trigger a catalyst for everybody to sort of pile into Lewis and, and drive that share price up. You know, the consumer outlook is, outlook is only starting to deteriorate. So arguably their bad debt cycle is only starting to, to sort of um, kick in. Um, and it just doesn't feel like the right time to be buying the shares that are very sensitive um, in these kind of times. And also their consumer is not interest rate sensitive. So interest rates being flat or, you know, there's more and more talk that maybe we see another rate cut later on this year. That doesn't really impact their consumer. What impacts their consumer is inflation. And you know, with the RAND weakening, fuel prices are gonna go up. That affects everybody across the board, whether or not you drive a car or not, it affects taxi fares. You know, our, our electricity price, all of these kind of administered costs, which you actually can't do without. So it doesn't really look like the right time to be piling into Lewis or JD Group for, for that matter, just because they're cheap. I mean, they've looked cheap relative for a long time. Let's chat about Woolworths now and, and what's unfolding on that front because you've got that stock performing relatively well. It has got a credit component, so is it in for pain down the line? Well, I think the, the point to note about Woolworths is that its own in-store um, credit is, is very low as a participated, I mean, as a contribution of sales. It's kind of between 20 and 30%. I think food is about 18 and clothing's about 30. So not much risk on the credit not side Not much then. risk, but that's not to say that their consumer doesn't have debt. I mean, just because they aren't lending to it doesn't mean their consumer doesn't have debt elsewhere. So it's not at all immune from it. But I think the reason that Woolies is, is holding up maybe better than others is that because it's a higher LSM customer, they are typically slightly more sophisticated. They've had better experience in dealing with debt. They're also typically those with, an unsecure, with a secured loan, um, vehicle, housing, both. So somewhat um, defensive in nature, you're saying their consumer? At this point in time, I'm not saying, I mean, if, if we see interest rates rise, then their consumer will be obviously af affected um, quite significantly. So at the moment, we think that the higher income consumers are relatively better off than the middle and lower income consumers. But if interest rates start to rise, then that picture changes. And the pressure could be across the board. Exactly. Exactly. Teresa, another story we've been keeping track of, obviously with uh, MassMart uh, being bought by Walmart, uh, we had, uh, I guess, communication from them that they really wanted to get involved in the fresh f food uh, sector of the market and they felt that that would be one of the areas they wanted to compete quite aggressively going forward. Can you just give us an update on how that's uh, going for them? Well, I think it's, it's, it's still relatively small. Um, I think they are finding it quite difficult. It's, qu it's quite a challenge to... Um, get their fresh format into their, their food co, which is in their game stores and then also their uh, macro stores. I think the macro store fresh offering is going better than, than maybe people had thought. Um, and I think that they, they, they feel like they're getting the model right there. I think the game one has more challenges because of, I mean, game is typically a general merchandise store, so it's back, it's uh, sort of delivery slots are necessarily geared towards um, fresh. But I think the, the big benefit of having Walmart as a big brother or a you know, major shareholder is that Walmart can bring a lot of expertise to MassMart that they wouldn't have had. So I think that's something that we'll start to see you know, incremental improvements. But certainly, I wouldn't say that they've, they've, they've got it right. And I don't think that they would claim that they've got it absolutely perfect at this point, too. One of the stocks that you do have in your portfolio is Hold Sport. It may not have been the best performer to this point, but you like the model and particularly the distribution warehouses. A little uh, elaboration on that front. Yeah, I mean, the, the thing about Hold Sport is a, it's a relatively small company, um, probably under, underneath most people's radars. Um, we like it because it plays into the similar kind of market group that Woolworths plays into. It doesn't have a credit offer, so it's a pure cash retailer. Um, so the sales that it, it um, books are they're, they're real. There's no danger of There's bad debts. Exactly, um, on, on their book. And, um, you know, we think it plays into, into a nice um, sort of niche segment. So Sportsman's Warehouse very much plays the growth in private schooling. Um, you know, people tend to spend on their children when things are tough. Typically men lose out first. <laughs> Then women. I hope you know that. I hope you know that, Warren. <laughs> and then and then children. So people will spend on their children. They'll buy them the cricket bat. They'll buy them the the rugby ball. 
and 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 so we we think it's relatively defensive from from that point of view. Outdoor warehouse is a, a little bit of a trickier business, you know. I think that they they're battling with that. But having said that, the like for likes in in those businesses are are, are doing okay. Um, you know, the last results that they've just reported now were slightly disappointing from an earnings growth perspective, but that was well flagged, and they'd given us um, a good good guidance on as to why that was, and it's really driven by their distribution and their um, distribution investment. Um, as well as some new store growth and also some investment in employee costs. So Teresa, 